Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. My name is Alexis Gerganius, and I'm the student president of the Buckley Program. Before I introduce our moderator for today's event, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The Buckley Program is dedicated to the promotion of intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We achieve this goal in a number of ways, including our speaker events, debates, annual conference, summer internships for Yale undergraduates, and various other activities. Undergraduates and graduate students interested in learning more about the Buckley Program should visit our website, buckleyprogram.com. Now to int introduce our moderator for today's event. Noah DePonte Smith is the Vice President of the Buckley Program. He is a current senior at Yale, and he is double majoring in history and political science. He covered British and European politics as an intern at National Review during the summers of 2016 and 2017. His academic interests are in European party politics, and his two senior theses focus on the Scottish National Party in the 1970s and 1980s, as well as the development of the party systems in post-communist Eastern Europe. At the end, we'll have time for questions, so please raise your hand and we'll pass you a mic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Noah DePonte Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be introducing our guests, then moving into how the debate works, and then offering a few preparatory remarks. Um, first, on my far right, is Niall Gardner, the director of the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom, and the Bernard and Barbara L Lomas Fellow. Uh, he's a leading authority on transatlantic relations, a former aide to Lady Thatcher. He appears frequently as a foreign policy analyst and political commentator, and most importantly, he graduated from Yale with a doctorate in history. Uh, Jamie Kerchick, to my somewhat right, I guess, uh, is a visiting fellow with the Center for United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, a columnist for Tablet Magazine and a writer for the, for the Daily Beast. He formerly worked at the New Republic and Radio Free Europe. He just published a book called The End of Europe as well. Uh, he began his career on the op-ed pages of the YDN, and an essay he wrote on the strangeness of the YPU <laughs> remains the authoritative work on the subject. Let's welcome them both. <laughs> It's still strange. Yeah, <laughs> it's still strange. Um, the general way this will work is we're going to have sort of five to seven minutes for opening remarks on both sides. We'll then have uh, 20 minutes for debate and rebuttal, relatively free-flowing. I think uh, guests tend to sort of do what they will anyway. Um, we'll then have about 25 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so if we select you for a question, just wait till we get the mic to you, um, and feel free to ask anything. Um, now, briefly on the debate subject, Brexit. Uh, was probably the most shocking event of my political life, a relatively short one, you know, at least until the events of November 8th, 2016. Um, but it was an event that seemed to sort of really hint at something changing in the world. And though it may have happened a year and a half ago already, uh, it's very much still with us today. The Conservative Party right now is still debating what to do over Brexit. Should they have a two-year period of transition afterwards, a three-year period? Will Boris Johnson be overseeing it? Um, it's clear that Brexit is still a very salient issue, both in British politics and internationally. Um, it's by no means a, a settled one, either. Uh, the topic of the debate is, should Britain ab abandon Brexit? But really, what it looks more like is, what sort of Brexit should Britain have? Um, on that subject, I don't know who'd like to speak first. Well, I'm forwarding the motion, right? So. You're forwarding the motion. so. Speak first, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. This is a conservative audience, or it's a conservative venue, so I'm going to make the conservative case for abandoning Brexit, for opposing Brexit. I think that what Britain is doing, and what, uh, what it's in the process of doing, is fundamentally unconservative. Referendums are not conservative. Putting uh, plebiscites, particularly on something as complicated as a country's relationship with a multinational institution that touches upon everything from foreign policy to fisheries, to put something so complex to a vote of the public is not conservative. Um, and I would just implore people, you've probably read it, you're Yale students, to read uh, Edmund Burke's letter to the electors at Bristol to understand what representative government is about, that you don't put uh, everything up to a plebiscite. You elect representatives whose job it is is to study uh, these important issues and to vote on them, and if you don't like it, then you can vote them out. Um, fun so I, I fundamentally disagree. I believe it's not conservative to have uh, left the EU in such radical fashion. I think what Britain is doing is a case of self-inflicted harm that will hurt the British economy. It's already poisoning British domestic politics, as we see uh, the Tory party move to the, to the, to the right in the Labour Party, uh, which has been hijacked by radical Marxists. 
And I think that Brexit will weaken the West precisely at a moment when it needs to stand united against rising authoritarian powers, in particular Russia. Now, the most tangible reason for uh, uh, abandoning Brexit is the economic one. The EU is the biggest market in the world, and Britain is a part of it. Um, you're going to hear today uh, by my, my colleague that by leaving the EU, Britain will be able to somehow return to, uh, to, to, to embrace its, its Gladstonian traditions as a, as a free trading nation. And I support free trade, absolutely. That's why I support the EU, because the EU is the biggest free trading area in the world. Um, this notion that Britain is going to be able to strike free trade agreements left and right is a pipe dream. Um, there is no chance, first of all, of a U.S., U.K. free trade agreement. This is what the Tory party is banking on. Uh, Donald Trump, in case you haven't noticed, is a protectionist. He's not very interested in free trade agreements. The notion that he's going to sign one with the U.K. I think is just um, ludicrous. Uh, as for other proposed free trade pacts that the U.K. is thinking of, of pursuing with Japan and South Korea, um, these trade pacts will simply duplicate the terms of the currently in negotiation EU um, free trade agreements. The only difference is that now Britain is going to have to stand at the back of the line, as President Obama rightly said when he warned the British people not to vote in favor of Brexit. Now Britain's going to have to stand at the back of the line as all these countries prioritize free trade agreements with the 450 million citizen member EU um, over the 65 million citizen UK. So why South Korea, Japan, the US would give precedence to a smaller country that's one-eighth the size of the EU is, is beyond me. Um, now, as for future economic relations with the EU, the British government somehow believes that it will be able to preserve frictionless trade with the European Union, so that it's going to basically be able to have the same sort of free trade, tariff-free relationship that it has currently as a member. So it wants to both leave the European Union and somehow stay within the single market, a feat that Foreign Minister Boris Johnson memorably referred to as pro-cake and pro-eating it. Um, he's a very funny guy, not the best foreign minister, but he is a very funny guy. Um, now, in order to stay in the single market, the UK will have to maintain the right to freedom of movement, which was the big issue, I believe, why the Brits voted against uh, staying in the EU, was over immigration. So how the UK is going to be able to negotiate this uh, is beyond me. Um, in, in addition, if it, stays, if it wants to be in the single market, not only will it have to maintain freedom of movement, it's going to have to continue to meet EU product regulations, EU rules of origin for goods and components, and all of the EU food, environment, health, and safety standards. At this point, why not simply stay within the European Union? Um, by leaving, it will no longer have a role in setting those standards. Now, you may hear today that Britain could pursue um, the path that Norway and Switzerland have, which is they're not in the EU, um, and they still have uh, free trading relationships with EU members. This is true. But guess what? They have to accept freedom of movement. And they also have to pay into the EU budget, which Britain would also have to do if it wants to be in the single market. Norway and Switzerland, despite having to do these things, does not get to be in the room when EU decisions are made, because they're not members. Um, I think immigration, I'm not sure if we're going to hear that much about it today, but as I said before, I think it is the main issue on why Britain did what it did. Um, most of the immigration into the United Kingdom is not from EU member states. About 70% is from non-EU member states, most of it from the former Commonwealth. So if, if the Brits were really concerned about high levels of immigration and wanted to reduce it, they could do it on their own by reducing immigration from non-EU countries. Um, uh, leaving the EU is not going to fix that. Um, furthermore, if you look at the hospitality, the food, the manufacturing and social care sectors, as well as the National Health Service, there are many, many EU citizens who work in these sectors. And I don't think that they will be able to sustain themselves outside of the EU, which is one of the reasons why the biggest businesses um, all opposed, most of the most of big business corporations opposed Brexit because they understood that it didn't make sense. Um, who else is a big supporter of Brexit? It's not just um, half the Tory party or the, the Eurosceptic wing of the Tory party. It's also the hard left of the Labour Party, which currently runs the Labour Party. Now, why is it? It's because they view the EU rightly 
as a pro-market, liberal in the European sense, economic community. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who is the IRA-supporting, America-hating leader of the Labor Party, he voted against joining the European Common Market in 1975. And he probably voted in favor of Brexit, despite his own party's official opposition to it. Um, it's unclear what his position on Brexit was. He was very ambiguous about that. Now, why does the hard labor left oppose the EU? Well, membership in the EU single market regulates state subsidies for industry, and it enforces fair market competition across the 28 members. These um, regulations and these, these standards, they impede the sort of radical left-wing changes that Jeremy Corbyn would like to implement were he to become prime minister. And let's be clear, you know, the Conservative Party is not going to rule forever. Jeremy Corbyn, to our, my shock and horror, is likely to become the next Prime Minister of the UK. That is, the, the bookmakers in Britain have him being um, elected at some point in the future. So what happens when Jeremy Corbyn and his hard left Labour Party take the reins of a Britain that's outside the EU? Um, it's going to be a very different Britain. It's not going to be a free trading Singapore in the North Sea. It's going to be uh, a socialism in one country. That's the future that Jeremy Corbyn wants. And I don't think that the conservative supporters of Brexit really took into account the implications of what they've done. Uh, finally, Brexit is likely to diminish Britain in a literal sense. Scotland, you'll recall, had an independence referendum in 2014. A major reason why the Scots voted against independence and to stay within the United Kingdom was because Scotland wanted to stay within the European Union. Scotland is very pro-EU. Now that Britain is leaving the EU, the Scots are being taken out of the EU against their will. And I guarantee you that Scottish nationalist sentiment over the long term will increase. And you could see a potential independent Scotland. Northern Ireland, there's not been a border between Ulster province and the rest of Ireland for 20 years. This was part of the Good Friday Agreement. No one knows what's going to happen to this border now once Britain leaves the EU. If they leave the customs union, which they likely will, there's going to have to be some sort of border between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. And you are going to completely throw the, um, the sectarian conflict, which really hasn't been a conflict for 20 years. You, uh, le leaving the, uh, the, the EU could, could light the fire again by putting a border up um, between Northern Ireland and Ireland, something that has been crucial for the Irish peace process. And that gets to the final point here, which is what this was really about. Brexit was really a decision made by the English, not the British people. It was a, a, a form of English nationalism. And it will lead, as the chapter in my book is entitled, it will lead, uh, I fear, from Great Britain to Little England. So on that note, um, I urge you to uh, support the uh, motion. Thank you. For the response. Thanks very much. Uh, firstly, it's, it's great to be back at, uh, back at Yale as a grad student here for, for several years. Um, and uh, I walked past Yale Law School earlier where I worked on the, uh, the front desk for a couple of years as an impoverished grad student. And uh, um, I'm very grateful for the, uh, the invitation today from the Buckley program. Um, especially to, uh, to Lauren and Madeline, who do a tremendous job here. And, and the Buckley program, I think, uh, plays a very, very important role uh, in standing up for the defense of freedom of speech. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, if you cannot uh, have freedom of speech at America's universities, uh, I think that you may as well not have universities at all. And so, uh, here, so here. the Buckley program really, I, I think, plays an outstanding, courageous role here at Yale. Uh, and uh, uh, very, very uh, grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. Brexit. Um, I had the, uh, the privilege uh, of being actually at um, Vote Leave headquarters uh, on the night of the, the referendum. Uh, and I was there until I think about seven o'clock in the, in the morning as all the results uh, came in. Um, and um, I was surrounded there by, I mean, largely young campaigners who um, had worked incredibly hard to help deliver this uh, Brexit result. And I think that delivering Brexit was actually democracy in practice. And the British people voted over 17 million British people voted. Over 70% of those who voted vote. Um, over 70% of, of the electorate actually turned out to vote. 52% uh, 
uh, voted for for Brexit. Um, and in my view, this was a, a very strong mandate for, for Brexit. Uh, and Brexit, at the end of the day, was a tremendous blow for the principles or a strike in favor of the principles of sovereignty and self-determination. And uh, James mentioned, of course, the, the issue of immigration, important factor in this uh, Brexit debate. But, but certainly, I think sovereignty, the desire for Britain to be once again a truly sovereign free nation was at the very heart of the Brexit uh, campaign, which was overwhelmingly led, of course, by, uh, by conservative rebels within the Conservative Party, but also supported by about a third of Labour voters as well. Overwhelmingly, working class Labour voters supported, uh, supported Brexit. But in my view, um, in voting for Brexit, the British people threw uh, a lifeboat off the EU Titanic, really. Uh, they had decided that enough was enough. And that, you know, Brexit was um, many, many decades uh, in the making. In fact, you need, really need to go back to Margaret Thatcher's uh, 1988 uh, Bruce speech for the beginnings, I think, of the fight against the, the rise of a European federal uh, superstate. Uh, and my former boss, uh, Margaret Thatcher, were he, she alive today, would be cheering Brexit. In fact, she first advocated Brexit as a possibility uh, in her 1992, sorry, 2002 book, actually, Statecraft. Uh, and um, I do recommend that book to everyone uh, here as, as an early, I think, um, call for, uh, for Britain to consider leaving the European Union. She was the first British politician to advocate that. Can you imagine, for example, the United States being submerged into some sort of pan-American uh, superstate? In fact, it would be unimaginable. The American people would never, ever accept having a good chunk of their laws, perhaps two-thirds of their laws, regulations being decided by a pan-American commission, by a pan-American court. The American people would never accept the loss of sovereignty that people across Europe have accepted. Uh, and for the British people, um, this loss of sovereignty was simply unacceptable. For over four decades, uh, for example, Britain has not been able to negotiate its own free trade agreements. Outside of the European Union, outside of the customs union, Britain will be free to negotiate its own free trade deals. And yes, the United Kingdom will be in a position to negotiate free trade agreements with countries across the world. Already there are discussions uh, with uh, no less than 70 countries across the world already about uh, free trade agreements once Britain leaves the, uh, the European Union. In fact, the negotiations on the US side with Great Britain are already very advanced actually for a US-UK free trade deal. In fact, uh, we hosted um, at the Heritage Foundation in Washington recently, uh, Liam Fox, the International Trade uh, Secretary, who was uh, doing a, a full week of meetings with the very top US uh, trading officials already discussing what a US-UK free trade deal uh, would look like. So this is going to be a reality. Um, it's overwhelmingly backed by uh, Republicans in Congress. In fact, there are five congressional resolutions in favor of a US-UK free trade deal already. Uh, the first congressional hearing on a US-UK free trade agreement was held back in, uh, back in February. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that Britain is going to be sort of cast out into the wilderness um, is, is pure fiction and fantasy. And there was a great deal of scaremongering, both ahead of the Brexit referendum and today, actually, with regard to, uh, to Brexit. But look at the reality. Since we've had the referendum, the FTSE 100 in, in London has soared. The stock market's never been higher. Um, the level of employment in the United Kingdom has never been higher. Foreign direct investment in 2016 was never higher. In fact, 75,000 new jobs were created as a result of foreign direct investment, additional foreign direct investment uh, last year. You've not seen an exodus of, of uh, foreign banks from the United Kingdom. In fact, quite the opposite. In fact, the city of London is absolutely thriving and booming right now. Uh, and Great Britain is the world's fifth largest economy. Permanent member of the United Nations Security Council one of the uh, strongest military powers in the world, by far the, the strongest military power in Europe. It has tremendous global uh, projection. Uh, it is a country with, with, of course, a very, very uh, distinguished history. Um, and for the British people to be shackled to a declining European Union is really not their cup of tea. 
It may be, you know, perfectly acceptable if you're living in, you know, Belgium, for example, uh, or, you know, Holland or, or Spain or, or Germany or France. But, you know, for the British people, they, they do have a very, very different outlook upon, upon Europe. Uh, and up until uh, Britain was a, uh, you know, became a member of the European Economic Community and then the European Union, Britain had always maintained its distance from continental Europe while intervening in order to maintain the balance of power. But Britain was never an integral part of continental Europe, nor will it ever be. Uh, and so with Brexit, Britain is able to firstly reassert its, uh, its sovereignty self-determination, secondly, negotiate its own uh, free trade agreements across the world. Thirdly, uh, and uh, Jamie alluded to this earlier, um, of course, in a, the immigration issue was very, very important in this uh, debate. Uh, and Britain will be able to control its own borders provided it leaves the single market, which uh, it definitely uh, will do according to the promises made by the British government. Uh, and so the for the first time in over four decades, Britain, Britain's gonna have complete control of its borders. That's a very, very conservative principle to be able to control your own borders, decide who comes into the country. And while it is true that there has been mass immigration, of course, into the United Kingdom from countries outside of the, uh, the EU in the past two decades, uh, very heavily so, of course, under the, under the Labour governments, um, there's also been mass immigration coming from European Union uh, countries. And, uh, you know, a city the size of Oxford, about 180,000 people, um, is added to the United Kingdom in terms of population size from EU migrants every single year. That's a huge figure. Um, Brexit is not anti-immigration. It's about controlling immigration, deciding who comes into the country. Brexit will actually make it easier for highly qualified doctors, surgeons, for example, to uh, come into the UK, work, if, you know, from countries like Canada, India, for example, New Zealand, from the United States. Um, and it's going to mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, greater control really over who comes in the country. And that, that I think is absolutely natural. I, I don't think that the, the American people would ever be willing to, you know, give up control of their own, their own borders and, and nor should the British, uh, the British people. There's also been a suggestion that Britain will be isolationist. Uh, with Brexit, uh, and that I think is, is really a sort of false uh, uh, flag here. Um, Britain is going to be uh, a very, very engaged leading power on the world stage. Britain is deeply committed to the NATO alliance. The Brexit administration you have uh, at the moment, uh, headed by uh, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, David Davis, Liam Fox, Michael Gove, for example, uh, this is the most anti-Putin uh, administration in Europe uh, today. Uh, and which is why the Russians have been very, very divided on the Brexit issue. And you've not seen Vladimir Putin talking, uh, talking about, you know, cheerleading for, uh, for Brexit. Because um, the Russians know Brexit actually brings the United Kingdom closer to the United States. It strengthens the Anglo-American special relationship. And you've seen that in the last uh, few months or so. Uh, you've seen an extremely close relationship between Downing Street and the White House. Uh, it's a far closer relationship between uh, this administration and any uh, uh, government in Europe. Uh, and Britain is going to ensure that the Anglo-American special relationship remains at the very, very heart of the leadership and the defense of the free world. And so will the NATO alliance. Uh, and as for the, as for the European um, Union, I think there are huge overwhelming problems with the EU including a fundamental lack of democracy, a huge centralization of power, unelected bureaucrats, dictating terms. You had Jean-Claude uh, Juncker, the head of the European Commission, just a couple of weeks ago delivering his State of the Union address where he talked about the creation and effect of a federal European superstate. And he also said that the British people would regret their decision. Now, that strikes me as extraordinary arrogance from an unelected uh, bureaucrat, lecturing the British people. And you can see why the British people wanted to leave the European Union with this kind of hectoring and lecturing coming from, uh, in my view, uh, some of the uh, most, um, uh, I have to say, odious bureaucrats on the face of the earth. Um, and, um, you know, the British people will, will not be told what to do by some bureaucrat sitting in, in Brussels. Uh, and I expect increasingly, uh, people in other European countries are going to come to the same conclusion as well, that 
their self-determination, their, their right to decide their own future will be paramount. And you're already seeing that, of course, with the, uh, for example, the, the battle now between the Polish uh, government and Brussels. Um, you're seeing uh, across Europe, I think the winds of change, um, you know, blowing through the, the continent. And Europe is changing. And Brexit certainly, I think, will lead uh, potentially to, you know, tremendous changes in, uh, in Europe for the better. I'd like to conclude by, um, uh, by drawing your attention to um, a key figure in the British uh, government. Of course, there's a lot of debate over who's going to take over from, you know, uh, Theresa May as the Prime Minister. Uh, Boris Johnson gave a barnstorming speech today where he talked about the British lion roaring on the world stage. I, I highly recommend that speech. Fantastic speech. Um, but I'd like to highlight now Priti Patel, the International Development uh, Secretary. She was one of the leaders of the Brexit campaign. Um, she came to, uh, well, her, her parents came to, to Britain as um, refugees from, uh, from Uganda, actually, uh, fleeing the Idi Amin uh, regime. They came to Britain with nothing, really. They built up, actually, their own uh, you know, small business. Their daughter is now a member of the cabinet and potentially a future leader of the Conservative Party. Um, and she, I think, is someone who really exemplifies, uh, you know, what, what Brexit is about, actually. You know, Britain, an outward-looking Britain, a Britain that will lead on the world stage, a Britain with very broad uh, horizons. Um, and, you know, Brexit is not about a little Britain or an isolationist um, Britain, but it's about British leadership on the world stage. It's also uh, about, I think, um, also attracting, frankly, the best talent from all over the world. I mean, that, that you are going to see that actually with, uh, with, with Britain, a welcoming Britain, a country that will welcome those who wish to contribute to the country. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that Brexit is a, great, is a great blessing for Britain. I think it's a great blessing for the United States for the Anglo-American special relationship. And at the end of the day, Brexit's all about freedom, sovereignty, uh, the opportunity for the British people to decide their own future. It's up to the British people now to decide the path that they, that they must take. They've made this momentous decision. And I think you know, the United States, Europe, and the whole world should stand with the British people in helping to ensure that Brexit is a great a success, and that's in that's in uh, America's interest. It's also the interest, I think, of every European uh, country as well. Thank you very much. About twenty minutes for debate now. So, Jamie, if you want to yeah. start us off on something you disagreed uh, with, <laughs> I have a few things. First, on the Russia question, um, I think it's very clear where Russia stood and stands on Brexit. You only need to watch RT, Sputnik, the various Russian propaganda instruments. They were very pro-Brexit. Which British politician appeared on, has appeared on RT more than any other? Nigel Farage, the leader of the UK, uh, in UK Independence Party. Or you can just look at the tweets and the public statements of the Russian agent in London who lives in the Ecuadorian embassy named Julian Assange. Um, you can look at what Russia has been doing in Catalonia last weekend. Look at the secessionist fires that they're stoking in Catalonia on their various social media accounts. The Russians like nothing more than disintegration within the West. So they're, now I'm not saying that anyone who supports Brexit is therefore uh, a Russian agent or on the side of the Russians. I'm just laying out the facts. This is what Putin wants. He wants Brexit. He wants Catalan independence. He wants Cor Corsican independence. He wants Venetian independence. The Russians even uh, support a California independence movement, believe it or not. So that's what the Russian position on this is. Um, Niall raised a very good question. He said the US would never accept an arrangement like the UK has in the EU. And it's absolutely right. And I would, as an American citizen, I wouldn't support us being in a political um, union in the same way that um, Britain is in the EU. But we are in an economic union for now. We'll see what Trump does with NAFTA. But we do have the same exact sort of trading relationship with Canada and Mexico. But the bigger reason why the US wouldn't and shouldn't accept such a thing is that the United States isn't Great Britain. We are the predominant global superpower. Uh, there's a, a sense of American exceptionalism that uh, exists in this country, and for good reason. The UK, I'm afraid to say, is not the power that it was 80 years ago. And in this entire Brexit debate, there is so much nostalgia for this imperial past. And I'm sorry, it's gone. It's not coming back. Uh, the, the era of, of the Royal Navy ruling the waves 
is long gone. In fact, the British Navy has to share its one aircraft carrier with France, just to give you a sense of where they stand now. Um, Britain cannot have the same sort of influence. No European country can have the same sort of influence on the global stage that it used to uh, before World War II. Uh, there's a famous saying by one of the founders of the EU uh, um, that there's two types of European countries, um, those that uh, realize they're small and those that haven't realized it yet. That is the reality of Europe today. And if, it, and if European countries want to be able to act on the world stage, they have no choice but to do so as part of a greater confederation known as the EU. Um, this issue of sovereignty is very important. We're making a fetish out of sovereignty. Sovereignty is important, yes, but at what point? Um, Niall cited a figure that two-thirds of laws in Britain are created out of Brussels. This is not true. According to the House of Commons, it's 14%. Um, this is a very tricky interpretation uh, that Mr. Farage also you know, passed along a lot during the, the campaign. Um, it is not, the, the, the majority of British laws are not passed in Brussels. It's 14%. Um, and I just want to leave you with um, if, if the Brexit that were happening was the Brexit of Niall and his friends in the Tory party, an outward looking pro free trading agenda, I would be more sympathetic to it. Brexit passed because of Nigel Farage and UKIP. That, is, that was the campaign that won Brexit. It was that narrative, uh, it was that man, it was that party that forced the conservatives into this mess in the first place. Um, and I'm afraid that that's the sort of Brexit that we're going to get, is a UKIP Brexit, not a, a free trading, globalist, um, you know, open Brexit. If I could respond to those, uh, those points. Um, uh, firstly, uh, Britain doesn't share its new aircraft carrier with France. I'm 100% sure of that. That, that. that is simply not true. Um, a second uh, world-class aircraft carrier is uh, to be launched by uh, 2020. So Britain is building up, rebuilding, I think, naval power. You're right that you know, too much has been eroded in terms of, I think, military power, not only in Britain, but all over, all over Europe. Uh, but Britain, I think, is, is addressing that. Uh, and I think you're going to see um, a far more powerful Britain militarily, actually, in the Brexit era. And that's certainly the vision of the British government uh, today. Um, the second point about um, you know, Nigel Farage. Yeah, Nigel Farage led party called the UK Independence uh, Party, uh, which you know, today pulls in, what, about 3 or 4% of the vote, something like that. Um, the Brexit campaign, the main Brexit campaign was the Vote Leave campaign, um, which was the official campaign. And that was led by uh, conservative uh, members of the cabinet who rebelled against David Cameron. Uh, and Nigel Farage wasn't in that cabinet. Uh, not even a member of the member of parliament. He was a member of the European Parliament, of course. But Farage played an important role in terms of getting the referendum. Uh, and I think uh, David Cameron bowed to some of that pressure because uh, the UK Independence Party at one stage was pulling in around 15% of the vote. Uh, he had a minimal role, actually, in, in winning, that, uh, winning that vote. And today, I mean, Nigel Farage is not in the driving seat at all when it comes to Brexit decisions. He's not part of the British government. Uh, he is a very peripheral figure. Uh, when it comes to uh, to the Brexit uh, debate, so he's not making any decisions uh, at all. Um, with regard to the the Russian uh, issue, yeah, may, maybe um, you know some people RT supported Brexit. That doesn't really mean anything at all. The reality is that Great Britain is on the front lines together with the United States, and the NATO alliance, defending the Baltic states, defending Poland, Poland against any kind of Russian uh, Russian threat. Britain is far more aggressive than the French or the Germans towards, uh, towards Moscow. Uh, it is a complete illusion to think that you know, Brexit benefits uh, the Russians at all, actually. Brexit makes Britain stronger on the world stage. It strengthens the US-UK special relationship. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the Anglo-American alliance, I think, that is the strongest force standing up to, uh, to Russia uh, today. And long may that, that continue. Uh, the point about uh, British laws, of course, there's a lot of debate uh, over this. I'm not sure what this 14% figure is, but um, I stand by my argument. Two thirds of British law is impacted by European legislation. That's one could, one could say derived, derived from uh, European uh, law. Um, European courts have supremacy over British courts. 
Um, Michael Gove, the, uh, the Environment Secretary, was giving a speech today at the Conservative Party conference where he pointed out that the vast majority of British law, in fact, almost entirely British law on the environment, is all dictated by Brussels, actually. And that's a prime example of, um, of Brussels' reach into uh, every aspect of British, uh, of British life. Uh, and, um, and that's an important speech by, by Michael Gove today, who was one of the leaders of the, of the, Brexit, um, of the Brexit campaign. Um, I would also point out, and uh, Jamie mentioned earlier that, you know, Brexit was all about English voters. Well, let's look at the figures. Uh, Wales voted for Brexit, actually. A majority of Welsh people voted for Brexit. Uh, I'd say they're British. Northern Ireland nearly went for Brexit. I think it was just under 50%. Uh, they're, they're British. Scotland, 38% voted for Brexit. That's, that's a pretty big chunk of Scots, actually. The latest opinion polls show, actually, that um, the level of support for uh, Scottish independence has dropped even further than it was pre-Brexit uh, referendum. And so there's no prospect, even if we had a referendum today of Scotland actually leaving uh, Great Britain, if that referendum were held today, the nationalists would lose very, very heavily, actually. So the union is, is strong. There's no prospect of uh, the United Kingdom breaking up uh, at this stage. And it's simply incorrect to say that Brexit oh, was just driven by the, uh, the English people. No, I mean, actually, um, uh, you know, millions of uh, Britons and other parts of the United Kingdom voted for Brexit as well. It was the English countryside, I take that back. It was, it was you exclude London from England, which was overwhelmingly opposed um, to Brexit. It was really a vote of the English countryside for, or the, the, out, the England outside of London. That's not correct either. Uh, Birmingham, the second uh, largest city of the UK, uh, voted for Brexit. Uh, so did uh, a swathe of cities, for example, in the northeast of, of England, where very heavy labor concentrations were. Uh, many cities actually went for, uh, for, for Brexit. And even in London, a very sizable minority voted for Brexit. But, but when you have Britain's second biggest city, interestingly, actually, a city with a, a very, very large um, concentration of, um, of, of immigrants, uh, at least a third of the population of Birmingham, that, that, that city voted for, for Brexit. So th that's an indication of the, of the sheer sweep of Brexit across both the countryside and many of Britain's biggest cities. You have further response. Um, <laughs> you keep on the immigration the issue, uh, you're right that um, the bulk of the EU immigration came under the Labour government of Tony Blair. And uh, the mistake that was made was a mistake on the part of the Blair government. It was not um, a problem inherent in the EU, which is that once the new European countries in Eastern Europe joined the EU, the pre-existing members of the EU, they were allowed to have a, a phase-in on the free movement of, of Poles and Romanians and Hungarians. They could put you know, a 10-year sunlight clause where we're not going to allow free movement for these people until after 10 years or whatnot. The Labour government was one of only, I think, three EU governments at the time to not um, take advantage of that clause. They vastly underestimated, vastly underestimated the numbers of people from Central and Eastern Europe who would come to the UK. So that was a mistake of the Labour government. It was not uh, a, a problem inherent in the EU. Um, and I don't think that Britain needs to leave the EU <coughs> to resolve what is a perceived problem with too many immigrants coming into its country. Um, EU rules currently state that in order to gain the right to reside in another EU country, that the EU migrants must demonstrate that they're working, seeking work, or self-sufficient. So if a Pole wants to go live in the UK, he has to, he can't just show up and you know, sit down and expect to live there for years. He has to either be working seeking work or be self-sufficient. The UK, however, doesn't have a worker registration system to track this information. So it doesn't even have the ability to know which uh, immigrants, which EU immigrants coming in are working or, or not working. And this hampers its own ability to, quote, take back control, which was the slogan of the Brexit campaign. So again, this is something that could be changed by a British government if it chose to do so without having to leave the EU. Uh, and we're already seeing the EU is making progress on this issue of migration, which is a very fraught issue. Um, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, 
is trying to amend the so-called posted worker directive, um, which would make companies that import workers from other European countries to compel them to pay them at the same rate as local employees. So to prevent um, you know, low-wage labor coming in and, uh, and un undercutting the domestic labor market. So there's movement in this direction. Um, I just think that what Britain is doing, it's a very rash decision. Uh, the costs, I think, are very clear. I've laid them out. I haven't really heard a response yet as to how Britain expects to maintain its current um, trading uh, arrangements with the rest of Europe. It's really just hope. They're, they're, they're just hoping that the French and the British and the, and the rest of the European countries are going to, as Boris Johnson said, let them have their cake and eat it. I don't see that happening. And if you talk to the people who are negotiating this right now in Brussels, if you talk to Chancellor Merkel, if you talk to Emmanuel Macron, if you talk to the European decision makers, and they're a lot more powerful um, uh, in terms of 27 member states negotiating against one, uh, there, Britain is not going to get a good deal out of this. So I just think it should be um, uh, abandoned at this point. I could pose a question for both yeah. of you. Um, it seems to me that Brexit has somewhat poisoned the well of British politics, mm -hmm. that we're now in this sort of fantasy land where Jeremy Corbyn wins 41% of the vote and Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, is a serious contender for the leadership of the Tory party. Um, what, what do you think is the political effect um, of Brexit on the political system? And can some sort of normalcy be reclaimed uh, while still trying to grapple with the prospect of actually doing Brexit in the next two to three years? Yeah, if I could respond to that. Um, but, um, you know, firstly, I, I should say that, you know, Brexit is reality. It's happening. It's not going to be reversed. Uh, this is irreversible. Uh, and uh, no, you know, no serious politician in Britain is advocating um, that Brexit be stopped, actually, or that there be a second uh, referendum. Uh, and, it's because uh, there aren't many serious politicians uh, in Britain. <laughs> 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 but, um, but you, know, I, you know, the idea that Brexit is going to be uh, stopped or the will of the British people is going to be blocked uh, is pure, pure fiction. Uh, and that's not the reality at all. Um, as for, um, you know, sort of poisoning British politics, I mean, I think that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's around quite a while before the, the Brexit vote. Um, and I would agree that Jeremy Corbyn is a poisonous politician, uh, you know, an admirer of, you know, Venezuela and Cuba. Um, and, um, you know, someone who, you know, makes, you know, Lenin look like a moderate. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, um, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's a very long way off from becoming uh, prime minister, actually. Uh, and um, the podium does not indicate, actually, that Jeremy Corbyn uh, is going to become the prime minister. Um, and I, I do believe, actually, that you know, politics is always, you know, it is always very, very, um, one could say that politics is poisonous. Um, and that's the situation regardless of whether you have, you know, big sort of earthquake like, like Brexit or it's business as usual. You're always going to have figures like, uh, you know, Jeremy Corbyn uh, running around completely reckless without an ounce of responsibility. Um, and, you know, a real, a real extremist who happens to head, you know, Britain's second biggest uh, because party, but to blame that on Brexit, I think, um, is uh, you know is very uh, is very unfair. As, as for the Conservative Party, and I think you have, and this is a big difference between the Conservatives and the Labour Party. The Conservatives have a whole string of uh, potential uh, leaders. So you've got Boris Johnson, you've got David Davis, uh, you have Liam Fox, Michael Gove, for example, Priti Patel, um, and uh, you know any any of these figures could potentially uh, uh, take over. Um, and then on the sort of uh, on the other side, you have things like Amber Rudd, Home Secretary, Philip Hammond, the, the Chancellor. Um, on the Labour side, I mean, you can barely identify anybody who's really fit to lead the country, and that includes Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, has been, you know, uh, a huge um, disaster. I think uh, for uh, you know, uh, well, he would be a huge disaster if he became Prime Minister. So, uh, but I don't think he will be. Where have I heard it before that this person could never be elected leader of this country? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Um, as to the likelihood of a second referendum, I think it's entirely possible and fair that there be a second re re referendum after the final deal is negotiated between the EU and the UK. I think the British people should have a say in that agreement. When they voted for Brexit, they had no idea 
what kind of Brexit they were being given. There's so many potential permutations of what leaving the EU means. And all it said was, do you think the UK should leave the EU? Yes or no? Um, and a wafer thin majority of people voted yes. I don't think something of this magnitude, first of all, this was an advisory referendum, I forgot to add. This was an advisory referendum. The parliament was under no obligation to respect the results of this referendum. Um, and it chose to do so, which I think was a mistake. Um, but that said, I think it is entirely fair, and perhaps I think it's unlikely, but it's possible that the, the British pe people be given a chance to see the actual terms of this momentous change to uh, the past 40 years of what they've um, had in terms of their relationship with, with, with Europe, uh, that they should be given a chance to look at it, study it, and decide whether or not it's really worth it. Um, as to your question about the normality, I think Brexit sort of ripped the lid off of um, British politics. And uh, it's made sort of everything possible, including a Britain led by a radical Marxist. Um, we have now basically two revolutionary parties in the UK. We have a revolutionary conservative party that wants to tear up 40 years of tradition and history uh, with its European allies and neighbors. And we have a, a Labour Party led by revolutionary Trotskyites. This is a very strange thing in a country like Britain, which is not, which usually prides itself on uh, being immune to the sort of romantic politics that we see on the continent. So it's a very strange sight to see this in Britain. Um, and I think Jeremy Corbyn has been emboldened by Brexit. He was certainly emboldened by the disastrous decision by Theresa May to hold an election last summer, which has now put the Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn within spitting distance of uh, 10 Downing Street. And I really think one of the only things that's holding the Tory party together, because there are sharp disagreements within, within the Tory party about the Brexit negotiations, the only thing holding them together is the fear th that this man could become prime minister. We go to questions from the audience now. Kevin, microphone to Aaron in the back. Um, my question is for Dr. Gardner. Um, you've claimed that this was about sovereignty and about a reassertion of British sovereignty. Um, yet, the whole premise of this discussion is that Britain essentially decided we don't want to be part of the EU, and they were allowed to leave the EU. So on a pretty conventional understanding of democratic sovereignty, it would appear that they already did have sovereignty if they were capable of deciding for themselves, we don't like the EU. So in what sense was being part of the EU an infringement on British sovereignty if they had the freedom to leave the EU the whole time? Well, where, where do you want to start in terms of the loss of, loss of sovereignty? The fact that British courts are not sovereign, the fact that Britain can't negotiate its own free trade agreements, the fact that Britain can't control its own borders as someone who comes in the country, those are massive losses of sovereignty. The fact that EU regulations work, that weave their way into every aspect of British life, a stunning lack of sovereign, sovereignty, loss of sovereignty that uh, the American people would never, ever accept, and with good reason, I think James said that he would never accept it as an American. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's unacceptable for Americans, but it's good for Europe. I don't quite understand the argument there. Um, also, the, the referendum, let me just respond to this uh, point earlier. The referendum was not advisory. Uh, this, you know, this referendum was implemented by the British government with the support of parliament, uh, and the, the British government respected the will of the people. This is not an advisory referendum, actually. It's non-binding. And if, if if the government had not accepted the result, um, I mean, that would have been uh, an absolutely stunning slap in the face for, for democracy. And, uh, um, and that, would have been, that would have been the downfall of that government, I, I can assure you. Um, but, uh, but there was no, no question of, of you know, uh, the idea that the British government would, would take this as some sort of advisory referendum. This was, that referendum was, was binding. Um, but, um, but yes, uh, Membership of the European Union does entail a huge loss of, of sovereignty, um, and, and the British people are now uh, seeking to reassert that, uh, that sovereignty. Um, and, um, and I think that um, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to be a free, uh, you know, free sovereign country, you can't be part of the European Union. 
um, EU is about supranationalism, no, not sovereignty. Yeah, James. It's uh, de facto non-binding. Sorry, if uh, yeah, it's it was it was it was a de, de facto non-binding referendum, if not de jure. And I agree. Obviously, once it passed, it would was politically difficult not to respect it, which is why I think it should have never been put up to a vote in the first place. And I think David Cameron will go down as one of the worst prime ministers in recent British history for even going through with this referendum. But that's the past. It's really not relevant at this point. On the question of borders, Britain is not in the Schengen zone. Britain does have control of its borders. Britain is not. The Schengen zone is the, the passport-free open border um, arrangement that, uh, that exists on most of the European continent. Britain is not in that. It's also not in the euro, which shows that there is flexibility within the EU. Denmark has, sim has similar carve-outs as well. Now, should the European Union have given the Brits more flexibility in the negotiations with David Cameron before the Brexit referendum was decided upon? In retrospect, in hindsight, yes, they probably should have. Perhaps the British people wouldn't have voted in favor of Brexit had, there been, had the EU given, um, had given up more. Um, but to be honest, I think the, the ultimate reason why this referendum passed was you had four decades of a uh, right-wing populist press that went on and on and on telling British people about how awful Europe was, about how the sizes of their bananas were being regulated out of Brussels, um, about the hordes of immigrants who were being thrust upon the British people, all sorts of uh, uh, um, distortions and at times outright lies. Um, and this is what you get after 40 years of this, of the Daily Mail and the Express and the Sun, and I could go on and on and on. This is what, this is really, I think, what ultimately... Uh, Jim, if I could respond to that. No. Um, I have to say that that is rather condescending about the 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit, the suggestion that they were led astray by the press, that they were perhaps too ignorant to make up their own minds. Um, and I think that if you, you know, if you speak to any Brexit voter, they would, they would give you a whole host of reasons why they voted for Brexit. But the suggestion that they were sort of misled by, you know, this unscrupulous sort of tabloid press and so on, I, I, mean, I, I think really um, is a tad insulting towards those who voted for Brexit. And, uh, um, and I think that, uh, you know, the British people, I, I respect their judgment. I respect their, uh, their sense of, of uh, patriotism, their love for country. Um, and, and I think they, they made their decision based upon what they thought was in the best interest of, of the country. And, and I don't think they were dictated to or misled or led astray by the, uh, by, by the British press. And I think that any Brexit voter would, would tell you, tell you the, the opposite of what you said just now. And to the left here. Hi, uh, Alex Frank from Washington, D.C. I want to ask if you think that this renewed emphasis on national sovereignty will be good for the international system. Because what it seems to me is that this is basically going back to pre-World War II balance of power politics. You alluded yourself and you talked with nostalgia about the time when Britain had loss of sovereignty and would only intervene on the continent to, quote, maintain the balance of power. And we already have hints about what this means. Poland, which again you mentioned is a positive, is going for authoritarian nationalism, undermining their constitution, ignoring like the basic tenets of modern liberal democracy. Russia's attitude was clear before Brexit. They were very much in favor of the vote, and now they're kind of treating you guys with this narcissistic condescension as if they're therapists or something. Like Putin said, oh, it will traumatize you for decades to come. So this is clearly consistent with like a balance of power type attitude where he's trying to divide and rule uh, Europe. You mentioned the environment and that's an area where there, you could see a lot more competition in these rules and then a race to the bottom. Um, and I'll tell you one of the big differences, well actually this is consistent with pre-World War II balance of power politics, is that the US's presence on the continent is much less than in the past for a number of reasons. Just militarily, we've gone down from like 250,000 to now we have just two combat units, two combat regiments in uh, Europe. So I don't think this is something we want. And I'll remind you that those times when Britain did intervene on the continent to maintain the balance of power, it was not always very pretty.
Okay. It, well, thank, thank you very much for your question, and you raised a lot of important points. Um, you know, I would argue the times when Britain intervened on the continent to maintain the balance of power or to stop an aggressor from dominating the continent, World War II, World War I, sure, war isn't pretty, but, but thank, thank God that Britain had the, the desire, the, the leadership, the strength to intervene to defend Europe from tyranny. And Britain did that throughout the 19th century as well. The defeat of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, I think, is a good example of that. And, uh, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, when you talk about great power politics and the willingness of great powers to intervene, at the end of the day, if you want to, if you want to prevent the rise of fascism or communism, you know, you need countries like the United States and the United Kingdom intervening. Um, you make a, you know, a very good point about uh, the U.S. sort of military footprint in Europe. It's been declining for some time. It was accelerated under President Obama. I do think that uh, you know, that process is being reversed to some extent now. We need to see a much bigger US military buildup, especially in Eastern Europe, in the Baltic states. We need to see a permanent deployment of US uh, military force in all, all of the Baltic states and also in Poland as, as well. Um, and you know, with regard to you know, Vladimir Putin, I, I don't think he made a single statement ahead of the referendum saying, yeah, Brexit's a really great thing, actually. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think you can find that. Um, but you know, the reality is that you know, British troops are on the front line now in the Baltic states defending those countries. Those are also EU members that they're defending, and they will continue to defend them long after Britain leaves the, uh, leaves the European Union. And so the British commitment to defending Europe will always be there, but we absolutely do need to see, I think, a significant strengthening of, of British military power and the military might of, of uh, all of the members of the NATO alliance. I agree entirely that British uh, involvement and influence on the European continent has been an unalloyed good, which is why I'm really sorry to see Britain leaving the EU, to see an Atlanticist, pro-American, English-speaking, great democracy leave the EU. It's no longer going to be able to influence decisions within the EU, and the EU is going to become more of a Franco-German dominated project, which as an American, I don't like, and I don't want that to happen. Um, I think, I, and so, I, so I'm sorry to see that. and. Maybe it's too much to ask, you know, Brits to fulfill my, you know, my dreams of having a, a more, uh, you know, liberal, small l liberal EU. Um, but I worry that that will be a consequence of this of this decision. Let's bring it forward to the front here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> easier than having you. <laughs> There was a French novelist about a year ago that had written a book, and what he said that France itself is becoming too radical secularist. Submission and, by a... Yeah, exactly. And what was happening there is he said, we're asking the Muslims, 10% of the population, to join us. It's 10% to join us because we have the better way of doing things. Now, they're not going to want to, his thesis is, they're not going to want to give up their religion, their God, to join a godless society. Now, when you ask England, and when I say England, I don't mean Britain, I mean England specifically to join with this group of people, it's a very strange group of people you get them to join with. In Germany right now, too, they've just a, a nominated six people into the radical right. In Germany, you want to support the Greeks. When do you want to retire, Greek person? 55. When do you want to retire, Greek woman? 52. And you want me to support you to do this? You've got to be nuts. Seriously. So I think a lot of common people, and I'll rank myself in that area, would be feeling this rather than the politics or a lot of the other things. I'd be curious in your response to that. Um, well, I'm not really sure what the first part of the question was about the radical right. The part right of the question is really saying that France is in a mess. Okay. The mess is 10% Muslim right, right. Well, can't Britain be integrated is, into right. society. Britain has its own problems with Islamic extremism that have nothing to do with EU immigration. I agree. There are Muslims who came from uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan or South Asia. Um, so that has nothing to do with the EU. That's a British problem that Britain has to deal with. And this didn't come up in the debate, but you know, Interpol and all the crime fighting um, tools that exist within the EU, Britain is not going to be able to take advantage of those, which is why most of the, he the current and for well, the, the former heads of MI5 and MI6 all opposed Brexit. They did not think it was in the national security interests of Britain to leave the EU. And I take the word of, of the heads of MI5 and MI6 on that, on that question. Um, 
I don't know. Yeah, that's, yeah. Over there? Yeah, let's go to the, yeah. So it's been about it's been about a year and a half since the Brexit vote, and the British and Tory government has openly said in many speeches, Brexit means Brexit. We're going to go through with this. There's no backing out. They've said this in many interviews. This seems like this is their, their MO. If any talk about backing out now could threaten the legitimacy of the conservative government and possibly usher in, you know, more amended for a labor government of Jeremy Corbyn, which we've, you know, argued could be very negative towards, you know, Britain's future. Is it is it too late to have a Brexit? Is it, you know, is that really an option to back out and not and, and have a conservative government still be in power? Or is the conservative government's hands tied, either go in this or lose legitimacy and eventually the next parliamentary election? I mean, so my, I'm not, I, I learned after 2016 just to stop making predictions about things because it's just not worth it. But so some, so something, things could happen. The British economy could go south. The deal that is struck between the EU and the UK could be, you know, demonstrably worse than the current arrangement that the UK has with the EU. And once it comes to that, anything's possible. So I, I said, I think the chances of Brexit being reversed are, are slim. But it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Yeah, I, I just uh, add here that um, you know, official Labour Party policy, of course, is to leave the EU. So the Labour Party is not is not suggesting that the uh, the referendum result be reversed. And uh, there may be some individuals within the Labour Party who would like to see that, but the Labour leadership is not saying that. Uh, and a very big chunk of Labour supporters are pro very pro Brexit. You also have a number of Labour MPs as well who, uh, who are very, very vocal on the Brexit issue in support of it. Um, and there, there is no, you know, firstly, there's no prospect of the, the British government backtracking on this. Uh, and the Conservatives are not going to, uh, no Conservative leader uh, is going to suddenly do a U-turn on, on the Brexit issue. If they suggested that, they would be removed inside the Conservative Party. And the overwhelming um, position of Conservative Party voters is in favor of uh, favor of Brexit. Can I ask you yeah. a, a question? Sure. Yeah. yeah. What if the deal yeah. that Michel Barnier strikes with David Davis is worse than what you currently have um, as a member of the EU? Is it really worth going off that cliff just for spite? I don't understand why. Yeah. Why can't you go back to the people and say, "Look, we did our best." We're, we're getting a crap deal from the EU. It's going to be worse on every aspect. This was a mistake. We own up to it. Let's not do this anymore. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the position, I think, was made very clear today by uh, David Davis, the Brexit secretary. He said, we don't get a good deal from the EU. And at the end of the day, a good deal is in the interests, not only of Britain, but the whole of Europe as well. Britain doesn't get the deal it wants. It will simply walk away. Uh, that is the official position of the, of the government. Uh, and they're quite capable of, of doing that. And if the, you know, if for example, you know, German car manufacturers want to lose a huge market in the United Kingdom, um, that would be to their detriment, actually. And you know, Britain runs trade deficits actually with most uh, major European Union uh, countries. And so it's in their interest actually to strike a good deal. I mean, why, you know, why would they not do that, other than to try and perhaps frighten and warn? Uh, uh, other, other members of the EU not to go down the same path as, uh, as Britain. But that, that would be, I think, the height of folly on the part of the EU if they wanted to really uh, you know, further wreck their own economic uh, ambitions. The negotiating position of the British government right now, it, it sounds like a man with a gun to his head saying, you know, do what I want or I pull the trigger. That's basically what this sounds like. It's just not facing reality. The, the, the EU has a much stronger negotiating position than the UK. And if the UK wants to leave with no deal, then that's, I mean, that's really bad. That's, that's really bad. No deal is, is I mean, well, I'm not even sure what the implication, I mean, you're gonna have to start, you're gonna, I mean, does the, does the UK even have a custom service capable of um, manning all the ports and all the entries that are now gonna have to have customs officers checking no. every bag and every car coming off, uh, off, the, off the channel? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think Dover, a country that uh, actually, um, uh, you know, one World War II alongside the United States is probably capable of putting a 
few customs officers on the borders. I mean, Britain is capable of doing this, has a very, very efficient, effective uh, government. Uh, and, you know, I think that there's a huge amount of sort of negative, you know, doom-mongering here. And, you know, uh, the Brexit is called a project fear, of course, during the, uh, the campaign. Uh, this idea, oh, that everything would collapse, the markets would, would collapse. There was one pundit, I think, who, who said in the Financial Times that, oh, yes, the monarchy would have to take control of Britain because there would be so much anarchy under, under Brexit. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all this frightening talk, but I think, you know, this is a time to be positive. Um, and we are dealing with, this is the world's fifth largest economy here. Um, it's the second biggest after Germany. It overtakes Germany according to some projections by 2030 in terms of the size of the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, Germany's economic competitiveness is declining. Britain's is increasing. Uh, I think the Germans have a lot to be worried about. Um, and their recent ref uh, election, actually, um, you know, ref reflected that. And I think it's significant that in Brexit Britain, you do not have a single member of parliament from uh, an sort of extremist political party, whereas in almost every other European uh, country you do. That's because of the uh, system and, you have. It's not because of, um, and I would just. Well, and th th that, that, that's important, isn't it? I mean, that, that really tells you a lot about the stability, I think, of the British. It's not uh, because business. the British people are just so much you know, more moderate than their German or French counterparts. It's because you have a, a first past the post system, which makes it extremely difficult for fringe parties to get so, in such, such as, Jamie. Yeah. Such as, the yeah, well, now the Labour Party's been taken over by <laughs> the fringe. And I would also say, yes, yeah, so the Labour Party's basically become an extremist party. And the reason why UKIP isn't, is, is, a non, uh, is a negligible factor in Britain now is because the Tory party's basically adopted the UKIP agenda. UKIP doesn't need to exist anymore. It succeeded. It got what it wanted. Um, yeah. I think for a final question, let's go to Alexander. Yeah, it, yeah. Are there two Alexanders? Anyway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, right. Michael Gove, during the election, famously stated uh, that Britain is tired of experts. So do you think that it is a positive thing that people now scorn expertise in favor of emotions, or is that perhaps a negative outcome of the Brexit vote? Yeah, an interesting uh, you know, point made by Michael Gove, who, um, who I should know very well, and who is probably the most sort of intellectual sort of figure actually in the British, uh, in the British government. And I think that what he was referring to was a sort of the, the chattering you know, classes during the, uh, the referendum debates. Um, you had the overwhelming sort of, uh, I would say, you know, political elites um, against uh, Brexit. You had all of the, um, all of the global, uh, you know, financial institutions, for example, World Bank, IMF against it. You had practically every world leader against Brexit. Bar Barack Obama famously went over to London and, and said, you know, if you British people uh, are stupid enough to leave uh, the European Union, you'll be at the back of the queue for a free trade deal. Well, guess what? Britain's now at the front of the queue for a free trade deal with the United States. And so I think that's, that's his reference, really. Uh, Go was talking about, um, you know, the sort of the, the kind of the, the liberal elites in, in the United Kingdom, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, people constantly interviewed on the BBC, for example, uh, who said that, oh, Brexit was the end of, you know, end of the world, you know, and that Britain would fall off the edge of the earth or something. Um, and so that, that was really what he was, what he was saying. Um, but actually, if you look at the, you know, some of the key figures uh, who led that, uh, you know, the Vote Leave campaign, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, um, for example, I'm very, very bright, uh, very intellectual uh, figures. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, they, they were, the Brexiteers are far more in tune, though, with what ordinary voters thought. Um, and very few pundits thought that the Brexit side could win this, uh, you know, win this referendum. And also almost every poll suggested that they were heading for uh, defeat as well. But against all odds, and with the help of President Obama, um, the, uh, the Brexiteers uh, uh, prevailed, actually. And uh, I mentioned the Obama instance where you had a you know, foreign leader intervening in a British domestic debate. Um, and uh, you know, I spoke to a number of you know, taxi drivers in London who said that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, you know, Obama's intervention actually helped you know, sort of solidify in their minds why Britain should leave the European Union because they don't want to be told what to do uh, by you know by a foreign uh, you know by a foreign leader. So that was a huge backfire by President Obama. But the Brexiteers really should you know um, give give their thanks to uh, Mr. Obama basically, for his intervention. You basically, heard the case for Brexit, which is cutting off your nose to spite your face. 
One of my favorite lines from the whole Brexit thing was um, not Nigel Farage was asked why he had taken up smoking again after giving up cigarettes, and he said, I think the doctors have got it wrong on smoking. <laughs> Just a great line. Um, we may have time for one more question if anyone else has one to go. Let's go to the back left in the suit jacket there. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, setting aside Schengen, which you rightly pointed out, Switzerland is not a, a party to. Switzerland is... Has, no, Switzerland I'm sorry, is a party to. Britain is I, I beg not, your pardon. I beg your pardon. Uh, putting that aside for Switzerland, uh, how do we reconcile the fact that, despite the fact that Switzerland isn't a party to multilateral trade agreements, trades bilaterally with everybody, um, exports over 60% of its GDP, yeah. has a much, let's say, much more prosperous economy than much of the rest yeah. of Europe, how do we reconcile that with all the dire predictions that? Um, the British economy will crater if it doesn't have access to all the wonders of u the euro and, uh, and the Switzerland European Union. Switzerland has to accept free movement and pay into the EU budget. And I'm not sure that the British government wants to accept those terms. So it might not get the same terms as Switzerland and Norway. So the Swiss example, I don't think, is a, is a good one. I don't, I don't, I don't think this, this British government is going to be able to achieve the Norway or Swiss model of its relationship with the EU. Well, they're not actually, I mean, I think they've made it clear that they're not interested actually in the, either the, uh, the Swiss or Norwegian uh, models. Of course, very, very different countries, much smaller countries. Right. Uh, I think Britain's in a much more powerful uh, position, but Britain is, according to the government, uh, Britain is going to leave uh, the, uh, the single market and the customs union. Um, and so you can't have a, a Swiss or a, or a Norway, Norway star model, as, as Jamie uh, pointed out, but you know Switzerland, outside of the European Union, while subject to some of its uh, you know regulations, uh, does does very well, uh, and uh, it's it is the most prosperous single country in uh, in the whole of Europe actually per capita, um, and you know it's it's done it's done very well outside of the EU, but as Jamie mentioned, it has had a certain level of access uh, in in return for uh, certain regulations that are that are imposed. So. Okay, I think this has been a most edifying debate. Uh, if we could give our guests a hand, please.